But with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Amanda to the conversation. Thank you. And it's really good to be here with you. Um, I, I have some imaginary jelly beans and some imaginary sunshine, and I'm pretending that I'm there with you. Um, but in all seriousness, I'm, I'm just grateful. You know, five years ago, I kept wondering why there weren't more conversations like this with people like you. And so I'm just really excited that these conversations are happening um, and excited to, you know, dig in with you all. Let's do it. Do it. Well, how about we just start with you sharing a little bit, a little bit more about yourself and what drew you to this topic? Why did you want to start researching and investigating and digging into uh, the topic of high conflict? Yeah, you know, I think um, about five years ago, I started to realize that journalism, which was something I'd spent 20 years doing was broken, that it wasn't functioning the way it was supposed to function. And it seemed like anything I might do would either make uh, the political conflict worse or have no impact at all. Um, so I, I sort of exited the room and tried to figure out how to be useful. Um, I went around the world looking for examples of people getting out of conflict, a politician in California, an activist in England, a former gang leader in Chicago. And what I learned very quickly was that I was asking the wrong question. First of all, it's not about getting out of conflict. Conflict is how we get better, right? As you mentioned earlier, it's how we push each other. It's how we get challenged. It's critical. And I think we probably need more of it, not less. But it is about getting out of high conflict. So that was a really important um, distinction that helped me make sense of what was happening and think differently about how to be useful. So just very quickly, high conflict is the kind of conflict that we're seeing a lot of today. It's what happens when conflict uh, escalates to a point where it takes on a life of its own. Um, we behave differently in this state. We make more mistakes, not fewer. We literally lose our peripheral vision. Um, and in every high conflict or intractable conflict you can find, people end up damaging the thing they care most about, whether it's their family or their country, whether it's political high conflict or a high conflict divorce. Um, so the challenge of our time, I think, is how do we shift out of high conflict and into what might be called good conflict in homage to what the late John Lewis used to call good trouble. Um, so that's that became my real obsession is finding examples of people and communities who have made that shift right out of toxic or high conflict into good conflict. And, and the good news is that it absolutely is possible. Thank God, you know, I've seen it happen enough now to be 100% convinced and I was skeptical uh, going into it. But the probably the biggest takeaway is that every intuitive thing you do in high conflict will probably backfire. So you have to do very unintuitive things and do them strategically. I definitely want to dive into that a little bit more. Um, intuitive things backfire. That feels dangerous. Um, I definitely want to come back to that. But before I do, uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot is like language and terminology. And so I want to make sure that we're that we're clear. One of the terms, or a couple of the terms that often in the kind of professional space we hear used to describe this are things like toxic polarization or hyper-partisanship. How is high conflict different from or similar to some of those phenomena? Can you help us break, break out or parse out distinctions between those things? Or are we basically talking about the same thing? Um, I think high conflict is an umbrella term and those are different forms of it, if that makes sense. So one of the really striking patterns that I noticed is that the behavior of humans at this level of conflict is very similar, whether it's gang violence or a diplomatic standoff or um, high conflict politics, political polarization, toxic levels of political polarization. So 
I, I found it for me to helpful to get out of the silos of each kind of, of polarization and, and think about it overall as high conflict. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. You also say, you say in the book that high conflict is a system and not a feeling. Can you unpack that for us a little bit mm -hmm. and help us understand why that's an important distinction to draw? Yeah, so one of the really useful things that people who study high conflicts and intractable conflicts all over the world do is they start by mapping them out, right? And it's a helpful way to look at the systems that are perpetuating each other because typically when you are in a high conflict, there's a sort of you know conflict industrial complex that uh, develops and that benefits from that system. And so the system works as design, but you have to kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated system. So it's useful to kind of visualize it. And some of you may have done that in different kinds of ways. Um, I think one of the things that becomes clear when you do that is how interrelated these different forces are, right? So it's really important to not get um, sort of overly focused on one lens through which to look at the conflict or one driving force of the conflict because you will miss other forces at work, right? And so mapping it in some way can be a helpful way to see it as a system. That doesn't mean that individuals don't matter though, right? Because any system operates at a couple different levels and one level is the micro individual level and the um, internal conflict really matters. And then there's the external conflict. What happened, who did what, power dynamics, those things really matter too. So I, you know, typically when you map a, a system, you will have connecting lines. So you might think about, let's talk about political polarization, right? Um, what are some of the forces at play? You know, let's, let's shout some of them out, right? What are some of the forces that we know are driving polarization in the United States today? Misinformation. Misinformation, that's a great one. And what's driving misinformation? Power. <laughs> Power. Profit. Fear. Fear. Electoral Fear. victories. Oh, Fear. Yeah. Electoral victories. Electoral victories. So another form of power. Uh, a system, a political system that is um, winner take all, right? So it's sort of designed to have every, um, every election create clear winners and losers, which is not true in many other countries, right? I think it was interesting when you said that there's a, that these systems develop and that then there is a whole group or a system of beneficiaries that grow up around it and that benefit from the system. So reinforce the system strength and that uh, really resonated when you said that. Yeah, yeah. So journalism would be a good example of that, right? Um, so the news media is an attention economy, just like social media, right? So when you create these systems, the individuals do matter, but they are also part of a system. So when I train journalists, for example, um, that is the first reaction they always have is like, well, you know, this is the this is the business model we have. It's click based. It's attention based. My editor doesn't want me to spend more than you know an hour doing this, putting this story together. So th those are systems problems that interact with the individual, like the psychological internal conflict, if that makes sense. So this is a very long, but thank you for playing along because I do think it's important to be, um, literally I do map out conflicts when I work on them because it is, it's almost like a homicide investigation. Like there are many players and it's important to try to keep them all in your head at once, which is, which is challenging, at least for me. I don't know, but for me it is. Well, while we're on the topic of all of the factors at play, you talk in your book, you have a phrase um, about conflict entrepreneurs. And one of the questions that often comes up in PACE is a question of like, who benefits from polarization? Uh, how do we disrupt them? Um, what profits are being generated? And, and is there a solutions industrial complex um, that, that can 
be supported. So can you um, break down a little bit the idea of, of what, what is a conflict entrepreneur? What does it look like? And what are the effects of that type of entrepreneurship on democracy? Yeah, so in following people who had made this shift from high conflict to good conflict, whether it was Gary, the novice politician in California, or Curtis, the former gang leader in Chicago, uh, or Mark, the environmentalist in England, or even Sandra, the guerrilla member in Colombia, there were certain patterns that were common to all of those transformations. And one of them, one of the things that seems to be a reliable uh, pre-existing condition for high conflicts is the presence of conflict entrepreneurs. So conflict entrepreneurs are people or platforms or companies who inflame conflict for their own ends. Sometimes it's for the very obvious ends of profit or power. Um, often it is, it is for more um, subtle, but just as powerful incentives like attention or a sense of belonging, right? Um, many times, not always, conflict entrepreneurs are people who have a history of unresolved trauma or neglect in their background. Um, not always, and that doesn't obviously excuse the behavior. I think we are all capable of acting as conflict entrepreneurs, and it's something I think a lot about uh, in my current and past life is, you know, have I, am I acting like a conflict entrepreneur? And we are designing platforms to reward conflict entrepreneurs in politics, in journalism, in social media. So we are seeing a lot of conflict entrepreneurs as a result, right? Um, but so that that is an, an important pattern to notice. And everyone who shifted out of high conflict that I followed, one of the first things they did was to distance themselves from the conflict entrepreneurs in their lives. So that that is sometimes harder to do, but it, it's an important step to notice who they are. Really interesting. I want to um, talk a little bit more about what you've learned from people shifting away and what that might mean for solutions. But before we go there, and then we'll we'll open it up for um, questions from others. Uh, you have a chapter in your book about complicating narrative um, on this topic. What have you found about the narrative that needs complication? And what do you believe might actually need simplification in how we talk about this? Yeah, so one of the big surprises for me in studying conflict uh, in recent years is, um, is this role of complexity. So my whole job always has been to simplify. And I think for anyone who works in communication, that is always the goal, right? Um, like a lot of things in high conflict, it, it, is, it doesn't work. <laughs> so it kind of breaks down in this environment. And let me give you some examples of what I mean. So uh, there's a place at Columbia University called the Difficult Conversations Lab, which is run by a professor named Peter Coleman and his colleagues. And they have orchestrated essentially, you know, more than 500 painful uh, conversations across big divides on controversial issues like abortion or guns or uh, Israel and Palestine. And they match people up. I actually you know, did one of these engagements with them and they match you up based on a big difference. And then they study your conversation. And what they found is that most of these difficult conversations could be sorted into roughly two buckets. Um, in one category were the conversations that went pretty badly, kind of how you might expect. And they were only supposed to last 20 minutes. In some of these cases, they had to be ended sooner. Um, and in these cases, people just experienced a, a sort of Groundhog's Day, like the movie, the same emotions over and over, anger, frustration, anger, frustration. And they left the lab less satisfied than they'd come in. But then there were these other conversations where people disagreed just as profoundly, but they experienced a um, whole galaxy of emotions instead of just the same one or two. So they did experience anger and frustration. And actually in the research, anger is an important emotion in conflict um, because it, it uh, assumes that you want the other person to be better than they are. Um, so that's different from contempt, for example. But anger is not into itself a problem, right? Um, so they would experience anger, but then they would have flashes of 
curiosity, of humor, of understanding, of surprise, of confusion, and then back to anger, and then surprise, and then confusion. And then so there was this movement that you can see in the data and that you can feel in yourself when you're in a good conflict conversation. Uh, people asked each other more questions and they left the lab more satisfied. So for me, this seemed like, aha, you know, this is what good journalism should be doing in, in conflict is trying to create this, right? Not trying to get agreement, not trying to drain the emotion from the room or incite uh, contempt, but, but create good conflict. And then they found out they could induce good conflict, which was pretty awesome. So all they did was they gave people a news story to read before they went in the lab. And one, uh, the control group got a traditional news story where you get sort of two sides, you know, one activist says one thing, the other activist says the opposite. That's kind of a traditional way to cover a conflict in, in journalism. Uh, and then the other group of people got a more complicated version of the same story. So it was the same length with roughly the same facts, but it acknowledged more complexity that is actually in real life. So they were acknowledging that there aren't just two positions on abortion, for example. Uh, in the polling, if you ask Americans about abortion, uh, you get different answers depending on how you ask the question. People will um, typically say that they have complicated feelings about it. They are not all one thing or another. They have internal dissonance about it. Um, and so just acknowledging that led to good conflict conversations. So reading this article about a different controversy, not the one you're going into debate with your, uh, with your opponent, so to speak, would prime people for curiosity. So this is an example of where complexity, if it is tethered to reality, you have to do the reporting, right? You have to have the actual information can lead to healthier conflict. It doesn't mean that you are using complexity to obfuscate or mask behavior, right? Or, or, or real abuses of power. Uh, it does mean that you are recognizing and surfacing internal conflict and external complexity in a, a truly complicated challenge.